church family. As you can tell, I'm standing here outside the church building and thankfully none of you have turned up here this week. Uh, it is our online only service this weekend. And so uh, wherever you're tuning in from, we just want to welcome you and we're going to enter into a time of praise and worship together and let me encourage you to engage this morning. Let's be uh, participators, not just spectators. Uh, this doesn't mean we just get to watch the worship. But we're going to engage in worship. And so maybe kick off your slippers, put the bowl of cereal down, or your Nutella toast, and your cup of coffee, and uh, let's in enter into worship this morning. God is worthy to be praised. He is worthy to be praised. And so we're going to gather this morning in our homes and, uh, and worship God together. All righty.
Good morning, church family. I hope you are having a great Sunday morning. Today, I have got Naomi and Jonty who are going to share to the children a little bit about evangelism. So, enjoy. Welcome to Every Nation Kids Church Online. Today, I've got some good news. What is the good news? Hang tight and I'll tell you. Whoa! 
whoa, 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 don't drink the hat. Why? Because I need it for today's lesson. Today we're going to talk about evangelism. What's evangelism? Evangelism simply means to share the good news. What is the good news? That Jesus took the punishment for our sins and when we die we can live forever in heaven with him if we choose to follow him. That is good news. Sharing the good news is what Jesus wants us to do. Today's verse comes from Mark 16 verse 15 where it says, He said to them, Go into all the world and preach for the good, the good news to all creation. We can never the whole world. Mm -hmm. We can never do that. You're right. It is way too big for you, but not way too big for Jesus. And that's why we shouldn't try to do it on our own. Who's going to help us? Well, if we are Christians, Jesus actually lives inside us. God wants us to use his power for his glory, not ours. So we can use God's power to make him famous, not us. Let me show you what I'm trying to talk about with an experiment that I like to call it Colour My World. What we're going to need is a plate, some food colouring, dishwashing liquid, a small bowl, some cotton buds and milk. So first of all we'll put the milk in which represents the world. And then we will add some colour. And then this is us. Wow, that looks cool. And this dishwashing liquid. It's like the Holy Spirit spreading the news. Wow, wasn't that awesome? There are so many ways we can share the good news with people around us. Friends and family need to hear about God and what he has for their lives. If you would like to ask more questions, then talk to your mum and dad about ways that you can share with your friends at school or family members that you know that don't believe in Jesus yet. Good morning, Every Nation Christ Church. It's so great that you could join us on this Sunday morning. It's a real special treat. We are having an incredible time at our church camp, and I hope that you're enjoying uh, watching the service from the comforts of your home. And this morning, we have a very special treat for you. Um, last year, I approached Pastor Timothy Lowe from Every Nation Malaysia to do a, a video for us to, to show on Facebook Live. And, and because we came out of COVID and lockdown pretty quickly, uh, I haven't had the opportunity to share this video uh, with you. And so it's a great honor and a privilege. And so just remember, this was recorded last year at the time of our 20th anniversary service. But I believe his word today is a word in season for us as a church family. And I pray that the service and this message would minister to every single one of you. So sit back, grab your coffee. And it's a real honor and a privilege for me to welcome uh, Pastor Timothy Lowe from Every Nation Malaysia uh, to minister to each one of us this morning. God bless you. Open your hearts and receive from him. Hi, Every Nation, Christ Church. Uh, my name is Timothy. I'm so happy to be invited by Pastor Bernard uh, to give a word to you. I'm really excited, you know, when Pastor Bernard had a uh, conference call with me or rather a quick Zoom call, you know, to uh, do the Second Chronicles seven fourteen thing. And uh, then he asked me, he says, you know, could you come and minister to us? And especially in the month of June, you're going to have an international month. So I'm just excited and potentially I'm the first international national speaker 
Uh, you know, every nation is really an every nation world. Every nation simply means you're going to have every languages, every kind of face, every kind of nose, sharp nose, small nose, big nose, you know. Uh, you're going to have all kinds of people there. So I'm just excited to be able to celebrate this with you. Pastor Bernard told me that this is your 20th anniversary. So I just want to cheer you. A happy, blessed 20th anniversary. And I just felt like God has a little word that I want to just encourage uh, the church. But before I do that, I want to introduce my family a little bit. Uh, you know, we have been in KL for quite a while and uh, God has blessed us with four children. So me and my wife met in the northern part of Malaysia when we were studying in a university called USM. That's when we met uh, and then we got them together and uh, just as every good Chinese, we planned our family planning really well. We had our first son and uh, three years later, we had our second son. First son is Joel, second son is Joash. And then three years later, we had Jaden, all three boys. Uh, and they're all so different, you know, we feed them the same thing. They're so different. Joel is really is a kind of mathematic kind of a guy, you know, he loves everything is statistics. Uh, Joash is pure breed music. Musician. Everything has to have a beat. He played the drum, he played the keyboard, uh, he plays the guitar. Uh, Jaden, as of now, still finding his way, but Jaden is really the most emotional kind of a guy. So if you hear Jaden laugh, he laughs so loud. If you hear him cry, the whole entire uh, housing area can hear his cry. That's really Jaden. So we're happy with three boys, and then we decided to stop. Uh, but about 12 years ago, God says, don't stop. And true enough, after we did whatever medically possible, uh, it was five years later, uh, one Sunday morning, my wife texts me, says, uh, I think I'm pregnant. And I remember I told my wife, that's impossible because we've done everything that, you know, you shouldn't get pregnant. She said, no, 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 I think I am. I was about to preach and I will never forget, I went up to the pulpit, I preached my fastest sermon. I can't recall what did I say. I came down, I rushed back home and then she showed me that little thing and she said, you know what? I am pregnant. I'm going to get a girl. And she was so full of faith. I kept telling my wife, don't tell people that. Our, our boy's gene is very strong, okay? Our male gene. Our first three are all boys. And true enough, nine months later, uh, God gave us a girl. So we named her Joanna. Even the way we looked for name was just pretty miraculous. Because all our kids started with J. We wanted something about J. Uh, and then we went through Jennifer, Jamie, you know, all those. And then uh, those are the names that my wife suggested. So I sat down with her. I said, hey, you know what? Uh, what about Joanna? I just felt like we needed a name that simply means God has graciously given. And so we check out the dictionary and Joanna really exactly means that God has graciously given. So we want you to know that our whole entire family uh, celebrate with every nation, Christ Church, and all that God is doing for you. Uh, and I hope one day we are able to go to New Zealand, pay you guys a visit, and then be able to get acquainted with some of you. I just want to begin by honouring Pastor Bernard and Colleen, as someone that has served in Christ Church for so many, so many, so many years. And I want to thank God for their faithfulness. Uh, every time when we get together, especially the Oceana Conference, and I think it was about last year or two years ago, we both spoke at the Indochina Conference. And Pastor uh, Bernard was talking about the supernatural, just contending, uh, believing God for that. And I was so moved as he talked about the stories and the different encounter that he had just because he decided to put on that little ear to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit. So I just want you to know that we appreciate his leadership and what he does to the entire movement. Uh, Pastor Bernard told me, this is your 20th anniversary. And he says, uh, could, you, could you just capture something about that? You know, as I reflected about your church 20th anniversary, a couple of thoughts came to my mind. Uh, interestingly, I've been a pastor for about 22 years, senior pastor of Every Nation Church, Kuala Lumpur. When I, was, when I reached 20th year, uh, there was something in me that clicked, and I'll share with you shortly. So as I reflected about your 20th anniversary and I reflected about my being a senior pastor, which is two years ago, I reached 20th anniversary, uh, there was a similar thought that just kind of regirded my heart. The other thought that I have behind my mind as I kind of piece this message together was I remember I spoke to Pastor Bernard 
I don't know, maybe about 8 to 10 years ago and there was a massive earthquake that happens in Christchurch. I will never forget the conversation when Pastor Bernard told me that, you know, there are people are leaving Christchurch because of the earthquake. There was a lot of uncertainty. Uh, so people moved on. I recalled that conversation and even as I pieced my thought together, I remembered about that. So I want to today preach a word that I think would encourage you as you hit your 20th mark, as you moved on to your 21st, 22nd, and 23rd, and moved on to the 40th and 50th and 60th, as the church continues to go until Christ comes back. I want to encourage you with a passage in the Bible. I'm going to kind of wrap around the entire thing with this passage, okay? It is found in Acts chapter 20. Now, no coincidence, okay? So I'm not trying to be numerical, uh, mysterious here, okay? 20th anniversary, 20th yes, chapter of Acts. I'm not, okay? But in Acts chapter 20, uh, really a passage where Paul was saying his farewell speech to the church and the leaders and the elders of Ephesus. Now, fun facts. Did you know, at that time, Paul hits about 20th years of serving God as well. Fun facts, okay? Uh, it could be 19, could be 20th, no one can date it exactly, but it was very, very close, just one year apart, or it could be the exact year. So you got all the 20th all lined up for you, and this year is 2020, okay? So that's it, all right? Uh, let's turn to Acts chapter 20, verse 17 onwards, okay? Let me just go there, read this passage, give you a little bit of background, and then there's one particular verse I want to just zoom in and that's why I'm going to part, all right? From Miletus, Paul sent to Ephesus for the elders of the church. When they arrived, he said to them, you know how I lived the whole time I was with you. From the first day I came into the province of Asia, I served the Lord with great humility and with tears in the midst of severe testing. By the plots of my Jewish opponents, you know that I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you, but I've taught you publicly from house to house. I've declared to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, when I read that particular passage, I thought about Pastor Bernard. I thought about him and his leadership that has served the church. I thought about some of these verses that you know how he lived. You know how he, when he moved from South Africa to New Zealand to serve, and with great humility, and I know many tears, uh, and some of the most stretching moments that your church has to go through. But he never stopped from declaring to you from public to house to house, just the word of God. And then verse 22, he says, Now, compelled by my spirit, I'm going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city, the Holy Spirit warns me that prisons and hardship are facing me. You know, think about what a bleak future, so to speak, from a human point of view. What's in front of him is just hardship and prisons and persecution. And that's what really in front of Paul. Then in verse 24, however, I want you to say the word together, however. You know, no matter how bleak situation, no matter how many earthquakes would have rocked Christchurch, no matter this COVID-19 situation has brought a potentially a meltdown economy, and some of you are really going through that. But Paul says, however, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task that the Lord Jesus Christ has given me. What is the task? This is the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. I thought about this particular passage. Let me kind of give you a little bit of background and we'll tie it together. So this is Paul's third missionary journey. Like I say, uh, you know, he went in his third missionary about three years. So he started with, you know, and uh, the, where the, you know, where he is, and then he go all the way and he went through the the the, the Derby, Lydia, you know, Lystra, and all those little things, and then he he. St- parked at himself at Ephesus for about three years. Uh, he wrote two letters and then he moved on to Macedonia, uh, visited the Corinth church, you know, and on his way back, 
uh, which is going to go back to Jerusalem. And that's when he really felt like this trip back to Jerusalem, he's going to be caught. And true enough, when he went back, he was being arrested and in prison, you know, all that. So as he traveled back the route, so he went for a big route. As he traveled back, he stopped at this place called Miletus, which is about 80 kilometers away from Ephesus. And then he he, he WhatsApp them or, you know, whether he Viber them, he, he Facebook them. He says, could you come and meet me? And so all the elders came and he knew that this is going to be his final goodbye. It is one of those emotional things because Paul knew the church of Ephesus very well. He started it in his second missionary journey. And then when he was there in his third, he stayed with them for almost three years. So there was a lot of friendship. There was a lot of stories that was uh, very special. Uh, in fact, when in prison, he wrote to the church of Ephesus, he wrote about his heartfelt about the revelation of who God is. So it's, it's a church that has so much friendship in it. And then he's going to say goodbye to them. So in this goodbye, which is also the mark of his 20th anniversary of serving God, he has this little statement. He says, what lies before me, honestly, I do not know. It doesn't look good. But one thing I know, he says, I consider my life worth nothing. My only aim, not, not many things, he says, my only aim is to finish the task God has given to me, which is to preach the gospel, testifying the good news of Jesus Christ. You know, as you reach 20th anniversary, uh, my simple theory of ministry is this, my simple theory of you and I becoming a Christian. The more I grow as a believer, obviously I know the Bible more, but I want you to grow more in what it means to testify of the good news. I want you to grow in the ministry of the reconciliation of the gospel, or we call it, we want you to grow in what we call the Great Commission. One of the saddest things that I think as a pastor is the more I pastor, sometimes I meet people, the more they grow as a Christian, the more knowledge they accumulate, the more they are able to tell you what tabernacle of David is and what Moses is not and what's the temple of Solomon, the more they are able to define the different color, the, the gold and what does it mean and the silver, and the more they have so much knowledge. But it doesn't translate to great commission. It just translates to great information. Uh, some of this who, 20 years Christian, would come and show you a Bible that has so many colors written out. They've read the Bible in and out. But it never translates to taking the truth of God beyond them to others. So somehow the Great Commission is really greatly missing. And that's the saddest part. But for Paul, after 20 years of ministering to God, he gets sharper with the gospel. He gets even narrowed down with his life and what he wants to do. And as I want to speak prophetically to Christ's church, I want you to know, that's my prayer to you. As the church continues to grow, as the church continues to get it to the, the crux of why we exist as a church, is so that we are more passionate to be someone who tells others about the gospel. But you know, honestly, that wasn't my story until 2017, which is also the mark of our church of me reaching or leading the church almost to uh, our 20th mark, okay? And uh, our 20th mark is really 2019, 2018. So this is end of 2017, just very close with that. So let me capture a couple of stories with you and it's just kind of uh, lift you and lead you to where I want to bring you. So I've been a Christian for a long time. I started pastoring in 1995, 1999. I became the senior pastor of the church. Uh, and there was a transition. So I led the church. Uh, the church grew. The church grew stagesly, gradually, slowly. I'm really glad for that. But 2017 was really the biggest uh, turning point of my life. In fact, if I were to look at 2017 when we took over the building and we started to gradually move into this, 2017, 2018, uh, we really had the biggest breakthrough. And we potentially have grown about 400 people just by moving to the new premise and just the streams of people, the backsliders and that come back and the number of people that got in safe. So 2017, this is what happened to me. 2017 is really kind of a setup for a perfect storm. Uh, there was an increasing dissatisfaction within me, almost the 20th mark of leading the church. Our church is well, the church is growing, but not at the pace that I knew we can better grow. 
Uh, so there was a growing dissatisfaction within me. So what I did was, I, I, the more I read the Bible, no matter whether theologically or experientially, the more I understand Matthew 28, the more I understood the criticalness of really live a life of Great Commission uh, and not be uh, distracted by so many other truths. You know, sometimes in Christianity, there's so many truths. There's so many great things out there. You've got Christian parenting, Christian marriage, and Christian this, Christian that. Nowadays, you've got Christian diet and all that. And sometimes in life, you can be so caught up with all of that. Uh, how the end time going to be, who is the, who's going to be the beast, and you know, who's going to have the mark of six. You can so, so many things that it just derail you from the main thing. So 2017, I kind of had a reboot or what I call a, a revival of the Great Commission. So what I did was I began to went around and looking for every unchurched people that I can find. Uh, I went to my son's uh, school counsellor. I went to our church architect uh, that kind of built our church. You know, he's not a Christian. In fact, he brought someone that eventually got saved and someone that got saved brought another person and that person got saved. And so I, I, just, I just went as many. So I gathered for about maybe 14 to 15 people and they were all people who do not know God. And I still remember, I had an interview with them a couple of months ago and they said, one thing we like about that group is because we were 15 of us, we do not know God. Only pastor, one person know God. So we, we outnumber him. And so we were really so excited when they came together. So they kind of became a community. We went through six weeks journey of discovering God and there are really many models of that. I just do mine. But at the end of that six weeks, maybe about four or five people got saved, but it, it kind of stretches on to another maybe six months. So by March 2018, I started 2017, October. By March 2018, I have about 14 to 15 of them. All of them said yes to God. And that was my biggest number ever got saved within six months. Uh, potentially more than I, I, I do it in six years. Uh, I see all of a sudden this whole bunch of people getting saved. And with that, I started my first life group because they are all connected with my life. And fast forward, 2018, we started the life group. By 2019, end of 2019, we had four life groups with them, uh, different ones of them taking on the leadership role and they were so young, uh, so inexperienced, but they were all trying to lead that role. And now 2020, uh, we are still growing. Maybe we added one more live group and, uh, and just that little heartbeat of Great Commission uh, has passed on. And I, I, I hope to be able to tell the story a year from two from now that how this group has continued to grow. But that little breakthrough kind of put a revival in my heart for the Great Commission. So that revival looks something like this. All of a sudden, everything that I do, everything that I'm trying to lead as a church, I'm trying to lead them through the little passage of Great Commission. I'm not trying to lead them to become better Christian. I'm not trying to lead them to become more spiritual Christian. I'm not trying to lead them to become more knowledgeable Christian. But I'm trying to lead them to become the Great Commission kind of a Christian. People who bothers and think and felt and feel for those who do not know God. So as you reach your 20th anniversary mark, I want to encourage you that you will be the kind of church that is not derailed, that everything that you do, you bring it down to the simplicity and the task of preaching the gospel. Just as Paul told all the elders of Ephesus, he says, my only aim is to finish the task that God has given me, which is to preach the gospel. I want to give you another scripture just to help you to see preaching the, the, the gospel a little bit differently, okay? Uh, so uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, which is a scripture, one of my favorite, because Acts 1.8 says that Holy Spirit will come upon you, right? So we know that we have the Spirit. But how does the Spirit of God express itself, especially in evangelism? Uh, 2 Timothy 1.7, he says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and of a sound mind. I always tell myself this, how do you know that Holy Spirit is at work in your life? How do you know? Uh, just because you lay hands on someone and someone fall, well, potentially can be an expression of power. But how else do you know? The Bible says you know that the Holy Spirit is at work with you when it expresses itself three ways. One, the power of God. Two, the love of God. 
three, the sound mind of God. And I use sound mind simply means we are totally immersed in just who God is and our understanding and the way we think about God is right. Uh, we are not biased, we are not extreme. There is a soundness, there's a wholeness in the way we, we do all that. So when it comes to evangelism, I want to tell you there are three ways. And when you reflect on yourself, uh, most of us come to God in one of the ways or all three combined together. Some of us, when we come to know God because we encounter the power of God, right? Our marriage was broken. Someone came, prayed for us. Miraculously, God turned us around. You know, I'm reaching out to a couple right now, one couple that, that tuned in to our marriage uh, seminar just a, a couple of days ago. Reach out for help. And I had a Zoom call with them. And as of now, two days ago, they've been telling me, wow, Pastor, uh, we do not know God, but our marriage is already improving just by the simplicity of taking some principles. So I, I want to believe that the power of God will eventually manifest in their life. Secondly, the Bible says, it's the love of God. When you begin to love people and allow that love of God to work in you first and through you and into their lives, the love of God, they will melt away every resistance that people has. And thirdly, it's really the sound mind, the ability to sit down and communicate the word of God. Now, some of us, we get saved because we encounter the power of God. Some of us, we got saved because we encounter the love of God. Some of us, we got saved because someone shared the gospel. And it makes sense. We just walked away and said, aha, your aha moment kind of helped you to say yes to God. Or we all come together to God in that three, three areas, okay? I want to encourage you. If you are someone who are passionate for the Great Commission, then I want to encourage you to be passionate in these three areas. Because these three areas are the little pathway that connect a person who do not know God to evangelize someone who know God. So I want to tell you three stories as I just kind of wrap this up. Um, you know, story of people who encounter the power of God. My favorite story goes to maybe about 2017, the, the first four person that led to Christ. And uh, this person, and uh, what happened was he has a girlfriend. Uh, she travels about uh, 45 minutes to an hour to see the girlfriend. So one particular night, this is before he said yes to God, but we're doing kind of a one-to-one. -one. So he, he saw the girlfriend and on his way back, the car battery was about to die. It's an old car. So he told himself, he said, you know what, I'm going to just kind of uh, slow down my car and travel at very slow speed, somewhere about 30 to 40, switch off the radio and kind of, you know, and work for another an hour to one and a half hours so that I can reach home. Now, it was midnight, almost 1 a.m. Then he thought about what I asked him to do. I asked him, if you want to encounter God, you just call upon the name of God. So while driving, he shouted to the name of God. He says, God, if you are real, help me to arrive home safely. <coughs> True story. He says, Pastor, the car plowed himself one and a half hours. I finally arrived exactly at my housing area in front of the guard house and the guard helped me to push my car back almost 2 a.m. or even 2.30 a.m. He says, Pastor, then he says, the million dollar question he asked me, he says, Pastor, do you think that is God? I call upon him. I said, surely that is God. And then he asked me, he says, Pastor, why didn't he help me to move all the way to my house? Then kind of jokingly, but yet at the same time, I think there's some truth in it. I told him, that's because you have not said yes to him. Then he said, oh, okay, can I say yes to him? And with that, he accepted Christ. Now, I kind of want you to know it's kind of a funny story. But you know what? That's the power of God. My job is to always connect people to the power of God. My job is to tell you them that God is able to deliver you. And my job is to pray for them. Another quick story. Uh, this is an old story, but kind of revived itself because of what has happened. So about uh, last year, I received a call from my friend. And this is a corporate friend of mine and, uh, you know, rather successful kind of a guy. But he called me. At midnight, frantically, he says, I need to meet you, I need to meet you. Which then brings me back about 10 years ago when he called me was because he moved to a, house, a new house and both his wife and the maid saw a spirit or a ghost or evil spirit just standing at the staircase. They both freaked out, ran out from the house, gave him a call. He was at a corporate event function dinner, 10 p.m., didn't know what to do. Then call me. When he called me, he says, Father, Father. I said, no, no, I'm actually Pastor Ken. He said, oh, Pastor, Father. Okay, never mind. He says, could you come and help me do exorcism? He says, my wife and my maid saw a ghost in my house. I didn't know what to do. I'm in a corporate event. So I went to their house. I prayed for them. Lo and behold, uh, that's it. The evil spirit never appeared again. So the wife and the maid both accepted Christ. But he haven't seen a spirit 
refused to accept Christ. Two weeks later, he was in a corporate function again and he was drunk. Went to the toilet, he fell, hit his head on the toilet bowl, uh, just like that. Woke up, no blood in the toilet, he called me. He says, Father, Father, or, you know, Pastor, Pastor, he says, he, says, he says, I want to accept Christ now because I think God saved my life. So I want you to know, you either see a ghost to accept Christ or you, you knock down and that's what happened to him, right? So he accepted Christ that night. They kind of grew with us as a church, but then they moved on to another church uh, because of the family, some of the friends that they had. Ten years later, almost same time, midnight, he called me, he says, Pastor, Pastor, Pastor I need your help. And this time he needs my help, not because there is another spirit, which I jokingly say, I said, did you see another ghost? He said, no, 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 no ghost, no ghost. And then he told me he was in a corporate dilemma that will cause him to go into jail. You know, I prayed for him and he says, everything points towards that direction uh, because of a deal that went sour and this is a high corporate end. I don't exactly know what happened. I told him to repent for whatever wrong things that he has done. And one morning, about a week later, I was praying for him. 6 a.m., I, I will never forget. And the Lord spoke to me clearly that the Lord will have grace and mercy on him. You know, the whole deal went on for almost six months and it was about just before the lockdown in this nation. One day he came to church. He hugged me, almost kissing me. And then he says, thank you for standing with me. God delivered me. I want you to know the power of God is incredible. Uh, so when you tell people, not your persuasive of words. Teach them to relate to the power of God. Love of God is incredibly moving and melting to the hearts. Uh, one day, I was just interviewing those that I helped to, you know, reach them. Maybe about, about a dozen to 20 of them we were kind of having a conversation. In fact, there was a little interview that I did with them. You know, almost everyone point to one single fact. They said, you know, Pastor, we said yes to God. Partly because when you journey with us, you were personal. Something about the love of God means personal. You want, you know, when Jesus came, he was personal. He was personal to the tax collector, personal to the Pharisees, personal to the children. He went down to their level and he shed his love to them. Which is why the Bible, Jesus is called the friends of sinners and tax collectors and the Pharisees. I, I want to encourage you. If you are bothered about the Great Commission, you want to be personal. You open up your house. Uh, you share the things that God has given to you. Uh, when you start to include people, that's when they feel that love of God in their lives. So all of us can do that, but we must be willing. And finally, the sound mind, just the ability to sit down and share the gospel and help to make sense who God is. I give you one of the latest example. Now, it, it, may not, it may not make sense to you, but it makes sense to this particular person. I was sharing the gospel with this particular person and then his question to me in the midst of COVID-19 was this, okay? He says, Pastor, he says, why didn't God create a perfect world? No viruses, nothing, you know, all those things and, and so that we can live happily ever after. You know, I said, when Christ came, Christ is called God with us. He wasn't called God that wiped off everything. He was called God with us. And then I asked him this very simple question, but it makes sense to him. I said, what would you prefer? You prefer a dad that is so rich and so powerful that created the next 30, 40 years of your life, paid for everything, your career, everything done for all. You prefer a father that is with you in the thick and thin of life. You know, everybody in that discussion immediately say, of course, I go for a father that knows us and with us. When Christ came, he is called God with us, Emmanuel. The with part is very strong. So even in the midst of all that we are going through, you know, yes, I, I believe that God will eradicate this. But I more than that, I believe God is with us in our thick and our thin. So I go through my bad days. I go through my difficult days. But because God is with me, I find strength in Him. You know, that little tweak of thinking kind of makes sense uh, to the person that walked away. He says, Pastor, thank you. I, I see that God with me is so much more important. Saomai is the way to be able to bring about, I think, a certain kind of thinking that helps people to land closest uh, to the way God wants us to think about Him. All right, now, uh, I want to bring all this to a close. And I want to say this, okay? Uh, Paul said it 
in Acts chapter 20. He says, I consider my life nothing. I made it my aim for the gospel. You know, when you think about life, there are only two things. What do you consider your life? And what's your aim? I pray that every nation, Christ church, that you will consider this to preach the gospel and make it your aim, that your task is to preach the gospel to as many people in Christ church so that the church will grow to a church and double up and two churches and three churches, pastors and leaders and many more will come through the rank uh, because the gospel is, I think, the greatest thing that ties us all together. Happy 20th anniversary and I pray that you will celebrate just as Paul when he reached 20th mark of his ministry. He saw a new passion for the gospel. That's what happened to me. I hope that ha that's what happened to you. God bless you. So excited. Let me pray for you as I close. Dear God, I come before you. Lord, I want to pray for every nation, Christ Church, and Pastor Bernard and Colleen and their leadership. God, I thank you that this church has been incredible. Lord, I remember once I spoke to Pastor Bernard and, and felt that emotion and that loss of people leaving uh, because of what happened to that city. But you love that city. And you have all this bunch of people that you have gathered them, uh, not as an intermediary, but you want them to sow your love of God powerfully into the city. So I declare to them as they reach their 20th anniversary mark, Lord, that they will be like Paul, uh, just that passion and even sharper with the gospel. Lord, I know that you have renewed my heart for the gospel. I pray that you will do likewise to the church, that the Great Commission, the power of the gospel, and will be something that is so consumed, will be something that's in them and through them, Lord, it will ooze out to everybody around them. I pray for power, love, and sound mind, that everybody around get to experience that. Lord, that you will refresh Pastor Bernard and the team of leadership and the entire church. Lord, I bless them in the mighty name of Jesus, we ask and pray. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Timothy. What a powerful word. And I believe it's time for us as a church to look outside our walls and really pray that God would use us in our city of Christchurch and the nation of New Zealand, but I also believe in the nations of the world. Thank you so much for watching. Next week, Sunday, we back uh, at our facility, Every Nation Christchurch, 42 Lucky Road, and can't wait to see you all uh, next Sunday. God bless you all.